Howdy neighbors, my name's Kurt House and I'm a director of the Wild West History Association and I must say that I'm a member of a lot of organizations but the Wild West History Association is my favorite organization and I hope through this uh, video we'll let you learn why you should be a member of the Wild West History Association if you are interested, seriously interested, in the history of the Wild West. It's interesting to ask people who are members how they became interested in the Wild West. And for me, uh, I'll tell you my story. Uh, when I was uh, six or eight years old, my grandfather Clayton told me a fascinating story about the Wild West. And uh, he said that when he was eight years old, he was what's called a news butch on a train out of East Texas. And that uh, a new news butch, uh, no, that's a strange term. I didn't know what that was either, but as my grandfather explained it, it's a little boy that runs up and down a train selling newspapers. And so he told me that uh, one time he was on a train from El Paso and he approached a dark eyed, serious looking gentleman in the uh, car. And the man was polite and bought a paper from him and uh, when he got back at the back where all the news boys were somebody said excitedly do you know who that was he said no he said that was Wesley Harden and my grandfather said I didn't know that he really probably didn't even know who John Wesley Harden was but I'm going to talk to you today about John Wesley Harden because although I hate to call myself a fan of a, an outlaw, uh, I'll just use that term loosely here today. I'm a big fan of John Wesley Harden. And it started with that story as a small boy. And I think that's important uh, that we remember that these days because I really believe that we should get the youth of today interested in history. Uh, from that time, I went through college and so forth uh, with an interest in Wild West history. I grew up on a ranch in South Texas. We're talking to you today from a part of Texas called the New Aces Strip, which was the wildest, most outlaw infested, treacherous, brutal part of Texas all the way up until the 1920s, really. Um, my own father, for example, uh, unfortunately was uh, involved in a range war down here because in the early days when he went in the cow business, this country down here in the brush country, we call it the Brasada, was unfenced. So the big cowman uh, just thought they could run cattle everywhere and they didn't want anybody fencing any little patches, which is where my father ran into 
big difficulties with some of the old cowmen. And that story is repeated over and over in the West as you study it through the Western states, especially uh, Colorado, Wyoming, Kansas, uh, and the trail drives progressed uh, post-Civil War. And uh, the theme of the big cattleman against the little nester or uh, pioneer who had moved West is a popular theme in, in a lot of Western movies. So uh, down here in the New Asia Strip, I learned about John Wesley Hardin. And John Wesley Hardin was an enigma. For one thing, he was very intelligent. Uh, over and over, we see from the evidence that he uh, was very uh, smart and he had some education. For example, when he was finally caught and sent to prison, he studied law and when he emerged from prison, he obtained his law license to practice law, which he did. But today I want to kind of hit the high points of John Wesley Harden's career, answering some myths about John Wesley Harden. You can read all about John Wesley Harden in all the books there have probably been a dozen biographies written of this man who was, in everybody's estimation, the best gun handler, the, the biggest gunfighter, the, the greatest gunfighter who ever lived. And I guess if you tally up what means great in terms of lives that he took, I guess that's probably true. Some say as many as 44 people he killed. Personally, I don't think that's exactly accurate. And uh, I encourage you to read the books and come up with your own figure. But certainly we have concrete evidence for uh, over 25 or so. John Wesley Harden, like very many um, Old West outlaws, and this is probably one of the most important things to remember, was a product of Reconstruction in post-Civil War Texas. As you know, the, uh, after the Civil War, the United States government sent uh, representatives and uh, installed state officers throughout the southern states to uh, keep the government running, but these uh, individuals that they usually installed in the positions of governor and senates and so forth through the southern states uh, were mostly Republicans from up north. So those were referred to as Reconstruction uh, personnel sent by the federal government to a South who did not welcome them. Uh, here you had uh, a milieu of Confederates uh, throughout, let's just take Texas for example, and all of a sudden they are having to obey the rules of Reconstruction, non-resident, uh, legislators and so forth sent here by the federal government. So John Wesley Hardin was a product, like many other Texas outlaws, especially of the Reconstruction government uh, in Texas. Uh, Wild Bill Longley, uh, you can think of a whole lot of other ones, but uh, they were pretty much racist and they didn't like black people and they didn't like various segments and they really uh, made it rough on a lot of uh, non-white uh, individuals. But in John Wesley Harden's case, until a few years ago, we thought he was born in 1853, but uh, Doug Ellison, another member of the Wild West History Association, recently discovered that in fact, he was born in 1852 in Bonham, Texas. And as you may suspect from his First name, John Wesley. He was named after the Methodist uh, founder, and his father was a preacher too. 
So although he grew up with a church background, he soon sort of turned from that and became a wild child. Uh, Dr. Richard Marone, who has written what I think is the best biography of John Wesley Harden called The Last Gunfighter, was a criminal psychologist. And he got interested in John Wesley Harden like I have. And he, in all of his degrees and qualified experience, set out to uh, determine exactly what was the nature of John Wesley Harden's personality and why did he do the things he did? Why did he kill so many people? Why did he spend his life uh, doing nefarious activities and so forth? So that's an interesting read and I encourage you to read that book. But the bottom line of that study was that John Wesley Harden was what you might call an early day juvenile delinquent. He uh, grew up fast, uh, hard times, uh, craved excitement, uh, wanted immediate reward, all these psychological things uh, made him sort of a wild bad man. And uh, he uh, killed his first uh, man at a very early age, uh, um, early teenager, I think 13 to 14 years old in East Texas. And I won't go all over all the murders that he committed, but he really took it out on the reconstruction uh, soldiers and people here in Texas who had been sent down here to preserve the law and order. But he really hated those kind of people. If you've heard of John Wesley Harden, you've probably heard the famous story that he even once shot a man for snoring. So if we have time, I'll talk about that. But uh, for uh, today's sake, he was a bad dude. And uh, he was quick, he was ruthless, he was smart. And uh, you didn't want to cross John Wesley Harden. Very few lawmen ever arrested him successfully. Uh, Jeff Milton was one of the few who did. I hope we get to talk about that today. But uh, from uh, his early life in all these troubles, John Wesley Harden eventually had to flee Texas and uh, go to Florida is where he chose because some of his in-laws were in Florida and he landed near Pensacola, Florida. And uh, he hid out a few years, had his wife with him, Jane Bowen, and uh, he was hiding from the Texas Rangers basically because by that time he had committed so many crimes that the uh, governor had placed a reward on his head and he was afraid to come back to Texas. So uh, eventually, uh, the Texas Rangers uh, learned where he was, I won't go into the details, but two of them, uh, Jack Duncan and uh, John Armstrong, learned his whereabouts uh, near Pollard, Alabama and Pensacola, Florida, and that he got on the train. So without a warrant, they uh, followed him there and were able to overcome him in a train car when he was traveling on the train. And you can read all these details later, but I'm just going to kind of hit the high points of John Wesley Harden and the myths about John Wesley Harden. Um, the first myth that I want to discuss is in spite of John Wesley Harden's short duration of residence in El Paso, everybody connects John Wesley Harden with El Paso. They think he lived there for years or he was a resident or whatever. Why? Because most all of the material produced concentrates just on that short period of time when John Wesley Harden was in El Paso. As it turns out, he was there less than six months of his life. In fact, I think it was only four months. So, backtracking on his life, 
uh, he goes on trail drives to Kansas and he does all his activities he's got in gambling and he's always into some mess, including the Sutton Taylor feud uh, in, uh, over here, not too far from where we are today in DeWitt County. And you can read all about that later. But he went to Kansas on the trail drive with his cousins, the Clements, and he returned and he murdered some more people. And first thing you know, he went to Florida then and he came back. John uh, Armstrong uh, and Jack Duncan uh, put him in jail and he went to Austin and he was convicted and sentenced to 25 years in prison for the killing of Deputy Sheriff Charlie Webb in Comanche. And uh, that, uh, I think, was about 1877. So he was able to elude the law a long time after that, but they finally caught up with him, sentenced him to 25 years in prison. And as I mentioned a while ago, although he was not a very good prisoner at first, he certainly wasn't a model prisoner, but he... Uh, eventually sort of succumbed to authority, which was very difficult for him. But he finally became a, a pretty good prisoner and was able to study law books and obtain his uh, license to practice law. I have in my collection about 72 or so uh, hardened related artifacts. One of them being the official uh, government document issued by then governor James Stephen Hogg, pardoning John Wesley Hardin uh, from prison. And it is the document that allowed him to practice law in Texas. So he served, I think about 18 years of his 25 year sentence. Unfortunately, he had a very, uh, sad life by that time, tragic events occurred. Uh, his beloved wife, Jane Bowen Harden, died while he was in prison. He wasn't even able to go to her funeral. And he had already had by that time uh, three children, uh, which uh, lived on after him around DeWitt County near uh, Smiley and uh, Yorktown and Quero in there. Uh, fast forward, he gets out of prison uh, and uh, in 1894, by that time when he got out, he went immediately to Gonzales, which is where he spent most of his time. And he had vowed to support the local sheriff, a guy named Jones, uh, was running for sheriff also. And unfortunately, John Wesley supported the other guy. Well, Jones got elected in spite of Jones once letting him out of jail. It's a mystery why he was against the man who had helped him. But anyway, that's just another mystery about John Wesley Harden. So he vowed that if the if Jones got elected, that he was gonna leave his hometown of Gonzales Texas. So in fact, when Jones was elected, he had to make good. So he hung up his shingle in uh, Gonzales trying to practice law. He had a couple of cases, but about that time he received a letter from his cousin, Jim Miller, who was related to the Clements side of John Wesley Harden's life. Uh, Jim Miller had married Sally Clements and uh, Hardin was on the Taylor side of the Sutton Taylor feud. So Jim Miller by that time had committed a crime in West Texas. So he summoned John Wesley Hardin to come to El Paso to defend him. And the uh, venue, I, I never could understand why when the crime was committed in Pecos, Texas, why they went to El Paso. Well, it turns out it was one of those cases of change of venue from Pecos, Texas, where Jim Miller's crime was committed to El Paso. 
So that's why he ended up in El Paso. And if I remember right, that was about March of uh, 1895. So now here, all of a sudden, we're down to the last four months of his life in El Paso. Yet, that is what you see most of the research and written material about. It gives you an a, a erroneous idea of uh, how long he was in El Paso. So in El Paso, he tried to go straight, but he eventually ended up in the same old bad habits of gambling and carousing and drinking at night and so forth. Uh, and he soon met what is termed a beautiful lady uh, named Helen Beulah Morose. And it's just uh, fascinating to read about his romance with Helen Beulah Morose. Uh, Beulah, as she went by, uh, was married to a Polish fella named Martin Morose. And you see it spelled various ways, but the Polish spelling was M apostrophe R-O-Z but you see it spelled all kinds of ways. Martin Morose was from uh, right up here around uh, uh, Sutherland Springs, uh, Helena, right around there. But he went to West Texas and he established a, a good cattle ranch and he was successful and he amassed a, a lot of land and cattle. And when he sold out, he got the whopping sum of about $2,500 or something like that. And uh, he committed a couple of crimes which caused him to have to flee to Mexico to evade the authorities. So uh, he jumped across the border and lived in Mexico for a while while his wife, Beulah Burroughs, was on the U.S. side. Well, uh, you might suspect what happened to a pretty lady with a lot of money in El Paso, John Wesley Harden was immediately attracted to her for various reasons, and they soon took up a, a habitation together in Ms. Herndon's boarding house. And there's some fascinating stories about Ms. Herndon talking about how fast he was with pistols. He would click his pistols and come around jumping aside and clicking them just as fast as he could go. She said he was absolutely the quickest thing uh, ever. And and all the lawmen agreed. The Texas Rangers once would, after they captured him from uh, Florida, they handed him a pistol and let him perform some of his pistol acts. And they were all just amazed. There are stories about him even getting a drop on Wild Bill Hickok while Hickok was a marshal in uh, Abilene. But uh, Anyway, back to the Moreau story. Here you have uh, John Wesley consorting with uh, Beulah Moreau's and uh, her husband living right across the border, afraid to come across the border, and yet uh, mad at her for spending her money with John Wesley Harden. Well, things came to a head uh, when lawman John Selman, who was uh, El Paso City Constable, and uh, John Scarborough and Frank McMahon, also Jeff Milton, who was the chief of police at the time, this was 1895, uh, decided that they would capture Morose. Now, there's a lot of speculation, especially in Leon Metz's book, that Hardin was behind getting these lawmen to try to go get Morose because if Morose was out of the way, you understand, then he got not only all the money, but the pretty lady too, just like the movies say. So uh, I it was in the summer of 95, I think June, uh, when Jeff Milton, city, uh, Chief of Police at El Paso, John Scarborough, who was a Texas Ranger, Frank McMahon, who was Deputy Sheriff, and who did I leave out? McMahon, Milton, Scarborough, Selma. Selma. Okay. 
see Marshall, I think. They enticed Martin Morose to come back across to the other side and they wanted to meet him one night on the old uh, railroad trestle that came across the Rio Grande uh, at El Paso. So uh, as the story goes, uh, Martin Morose uh, cautiously at night uh, came across the bridge with uh, I think it was Selman, and as he uh, got to the U.S. side, the lawman said, throw up your hands, and he went for his gun, and he started to shoot, and Jeff Belton shot him in the heart, and then Scarborough and McMahon both shot him. It's, it's a little known fact that Frank McMahon was the brother-in-law of George Scarborough, so Obviously, there were some things going on there, and Leon Metz, for one, uh, who I would consider a hardened, the late Leon Metz, who unfortunately we just lost him a few months ago. He was a Wild West History Association member also, believed uh, conscientiously that uh, this was all Hardin's idea to knock off Moreau's. So whatever the explanation is, just one of those myths. Uh, they killed Morose, now he's out of the way. Now Hardin's sitting pretty in El Paso. He's got the, the money, all the money. He's got the beautiful girl, and he's set up in El Paso. Now, if you understand uh, about a bad man's mentality, that is the setting for bad things to come, as Dr. Marone, the psychologist, shows us in his book. And of course, bad things did come. Uh, Hardin continues his horrible uh, sprees. He gets worse and worse and worse. He drinks more and more and more. And at that time, there were three famous watering holes in El Paso. The Wigwam, the Acme Saloon, and the Gym. The Gym was the fanciest one. And I have the stained glass windows from the uh, card room in the upstairs of the gym uh, saloon, but I've seen pictures of it and it was one fancy place. It, it was fancy as any New York dive you could come up with. And Hardin eventually bought half interest in the Wigwam saloon and he planned to eventually take it over. And amongst collectors, which I'm one, there are a lot of uh, little uh, chits which are cut out of a big notebook where they kept the account of John Wesley Harden's bar bills. And so we have a real nice record of him going down, down, down. He would buy quarts of whiskey at night, take them back to his room and drink it all that night and he'd get in horrible fights with Beulah. And about this time, uh, Hardin had already started on his autobiography and he wanted Beulah to help him write this. So uh, picture them, you know, working at night, trying to finish his autobiography and getting him getting drunk and flashing his pistols. He threatened to kill her several times. And, and it just went from bad to worse. Uh, but, uh, one night in May of 1895, I think it was May the 5th, uh, Hardin goes to the gym saloon and he loses $90 in the crap game. And he was about half drunk, so he all of a sudden pulls a pistol and holds it on the uh, I'm not sure what you call a crap shooter dealer, but I'm gonna call him a dealer. Whatever you call it, a croupier, I think is the correct name. But anyway, the guy's name was Phil Baker, I remember that. And uh, so he said, Phil, I want my $90 back. I've lost my $90. And of course, everybody's on edge and they, of course, Phil gives him his $90 back. And according to the newspaper accounts in El Paso the next day, it says, Mr. Hardin 
strode calmly out, daring anyone to uh, approach him. So when John Wesley Harden was not drunk, he was dangerous. But when he was drunk, he was really bad, really dangerous. Nobody wanted to try to arrest John Wesley Harden. No lawman, tell you an exception of that in a minute, which is amazing. But uh, anyway, he, he gets out, he goes back to his boarding house and uh, next day they write it up in the El Paso paper and tell you the story. But when he did that, uh, Deputy Will Tenike was sent to arrest him. And fortunately, uh, he was sober when Deputy Tenike went over there and arrested him. And he took him to the sheriff's office and confiscated his pistol. And that pistol is a very rare artifact in the history of Old West because it's one of the few instances in the entire history of the Old West where they recorded the serial number. And I'm a collector. You know, there's some collectors that are historians and not all historians are collectors. So I got into history sort of by the back door from collecting, but I appreciate what these artifacts mean. And here with us now, we have John Wesley Harden's pistol that was confiscated that hot May night in El Paso. And we have the serial number recorded. And the thing to take away here is that in the history of the West, you read all kinds of accounts of famous people's pistols, you know, Billy the Kid's pistol, Pat Garrett's pistol, Wired Earp's pistol, here's the gun that killed Billy the Kid, you know, all this stuff. But very few times do you see a weapon that is recorded indisputably in the court records by serial number, because that's the nice thing about guns. There's only one gun of this model with this number on the belly. So we know it was this exact gun. That's what separates this gun from all the others that were claimed to be John Wesley Harden's guns. So uh, to me, having a weapon of a famous bad man of the West and having it in your hands and feeling it and know that John Wesley Harden's hands were around this pistol and it was the pistol that was confiscated that dangerous night in the gym is pretty exciting. Well, to uh, conclude, I just want to discuss his death with you just a little bit. And uh, the circumstances around John Wesley Harden's death are uh, fraught with uh, errors and uh, mysteries and, and a lot of people don't understand exactly what happened. In fact, really nobody knows what really happened. But I'll go over some of the main testimony with you here at the risk of taking too long. Uh, on the night of August 19th, 1895, John Wesley Harden's career came to an end. And the way it happened was he had gotten into a squabble with John Selman, who was the, I think they called him city marshal. Uh, by that time, Jeff Milton, the former chief of police had resigned after he had arrested Harden one night. Uh, and uh, he was, really had a bad feud going with uh, John Selman, whose son, John Selman Jr., was on the police force in El Paso. And uh, history tells us that a few nights preceding that, that John Selman Jr. had arrested Beulah Moreau's uh, for wildly carrying and threatening to shoot pistols downtown at night while John Wesley Harden was out of town. Well, when John Wesley came back a few days later, he really got mad at both Selmans for doing that. 
And he said, you wouldn't have done that if I were here. And in the paper, he uh, put a hilarious note uh, that I won't go into, but anyway, he threatened John Selman uh, and basically threatened to kill him. So in the old West, uh, threatening to kill somebody, especially if you had a witness that somebody said that, that was good enough for you to be able to shoot the guy the next time you saw him and claim self-defense. That happened over and over and over again. Because if somebody was heard to threaten your life, then you got off. So the night, and, and the night of August 19th was one of those hot, horrible nights in El Paso. And 10 o'clock at night, everybody was up because nobody could sleep. They were sweating in their beds. So John Wesley Harden goes down to the Acme Saloon. He's playing dice with a, a bartender named Brown and John Selman, uh, I won't go into all the details, but he simply walks up to his back uh, about 12 feet away, pulls his gun and shoots John Wesley Harden in the back of the head. Then when Harden fell down, he shot three more times. So I think four shots were fired. Uh, Harden was hit in the arm after he fell down. This is another thing you don't get out of the literature because the entry wounds were from the top. And the three doctors that performed the autopsies on uh, Harden concluded that yes, he was shot in the back of the head. In spite of John Selman claiming that no, he turned around, he went for his gun and I shot him in the face. There was a, a bystander there who made the, the uh, rather uh, funny comment that uh, I would say if uh, John Wesley Harden, was sh if, if John Selman shot John Wesley Harden uh, in the front, that was good accuracy, but if he shot him in the back of the head, that showed good judgment. So uh, that caused quite a controversy. But ever since then, according to the wounds on Harden's body, the main bullet exited just over his left eye. And the photograph that the coroner took at that time shows a very small wound right above his eye, which does not look like an exit wound. It looks like an entry wound to any pathologist. Uh, I was trained in forensic anthropology and I know what an exit wound looks like, what an entry wound looks like. And the fascinating part of this deal is that of the four shots that were fired, one of them hit the frame of the a mirror in the Acme Saloon and fell on the floor and the proprietor, George Look, went over and picked it up and put it in a bottle with some cotton. And that bullet is known today and preserved in a collection of William I. Coke. Uh, along with the gun, the original bullet, and other evidence that ended the life of John Wesley Harden. But there's still mysteries, there's still work to be done. So uh, join with us in the Wild West History Association to help us uh, find answers to some of these mysteries. Great. Is that good enough? Absolutely great. Very yeah, good. Really good. Oh, That's thank the best you. hour and a half I have spent since I felt open yeah. too long. Exactly. <laughs>